Uh, welcome to the third hearing of the Public Accountability Committee's inquiry into the government's management of the COVID-19 pandemic. We apologise for the half hour delay in commencement. We had some difficulty getting the minister and the police commissioner um, in the meeting, but I'm glad to say they are here. The inquiry is intended to provide ongoing parliamentary oversight to the government's response of the unfolding pandemic. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land that at least I am on. I would also like to pay respects to the elders past and present of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginal peoples present. Today we'll hear evidence from witnesses from the police portfolio in the morning, including the Commissioner of Police, Michael Fuller, Minister for Police and Emergency Services, the Honourable David Elliott, and the Secretary, Michael Coots Trotter. In the afternoon, from the Better Regulation and Finance portfolios, we'll hear from witnesses, including the Minister for Better Regulation and Innovation and the Minister for Small Business and Finance. Uh, the role of police during a public health crisis is clearly a matter of public interest. While in the initial weeks of the inquiry, the lead agency was New South Wales Health, more recently, New South Wales Police have assumed that role. The way in which public health orders have been interpreted and enforced by New South Wales Police and the scope of the role of the Commissioner for Police are relevant subject matters for this inquiry. This pandemic has also placed extreme financial pressures on many people. Some of the most vulnerable in our community at this time are renters. The government's response on this issue has been a matter of significant public debate. With the prospect of continuing economic difficulties and the potential withdrawal of some or all of the Commonwealth government's income support, the pressures on renters will only increase, and therefore the government's policy responses will become increasingly important. These are matters that will be discussed in this afternoon's hearing. I'd now like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Like so many other things we've needed to adapt in the face of the COVID-19 health measures, these hearings for this inquiry will be conducted via video conferencing. This enables the work of the committee to continue without compromising the health and safety of members, witnesses and staff. If participants lose their internet connection and are disconnected from the virtual hearing, they are asked to rejoin the hearing by using the same link as provided by the committee secretariat. Webcasting. Today's hearing is being broadcast live via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website as soon as it becomes available. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness in this hearing, according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness can only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days. Finally, could everyone please mute their microphones when they're not speaking? All witnesses from departments, statutory bodies or corporations will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Minister, I remind you that you do not need to be sworn as you already have sworn an oath to your office as a member of parliament. For all other witnesses, I ask that you state in turn your full name, position, title and agency, and then take either an oath or an affirmation. Both, both of the words, both the oath and affirmation are on the cards on the table in front of you. And uh, uh, Secretary Coots Trotter, if we could start with you. Certainly, Mr. Shoebridge. Michael Kutztrotter, Secretary of the Department of Communities and Justice. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you, Mr. Kutztrotter. Uh, Commissioner. Commissioner Michael Fuller, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, did you like to start by making a short statement? No, happy to get straight to questions. We'll proceed to the opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a question to the Commissioner for Police. Um, in relation to the public health orders, which uh, your police force has the responsibility of uh, enforcing, uh, before the health minister made the orders, was there consultation with you or the police force about the content of those orders? Uh, there were a number of different orders constructed uh, during the course of the emergency. Uh, so different orders would no doubt have had different uh, you know, correspondence between General Counsel and the CECON, either myself or Deputy Commissioner Warboys in most cases. Okay, there's a number of different uh, orders uh, that have been made. There was the events order made on the 15th of March, gatherings order 25 March, a restriction on gathering and movement made on the 30th of March, which seems to be the main one. Then there were a series of amending orders, 4 April, 9 April, I think 30 April and 7 May. 
but more recently there's a quite a substantial new public health order uh, 14 May 2020. Unlike the others, it's not styled as an amendment, it's a, a revocation and remaking. Is it your understanding that this is a, a brand new order rather than an, an amendment to the existing orders? I'd have to see that order, Mr. Searle. So okay. Read it out to me. Um, okay, well, I'm not sure which room you're in, but um, can I ask you this question? I think in uh, one of the many press conferences, uh, you indicated that, um, it, at least it was your present intention, that the orders uh, having a life of 90 days, you wouldn't be seeking an extension of the public health orders. Um, if this order made on the 14th of May is a brand new order, wouldn't that have a new 90 day time frame? So I'd have and to take advice that. on it, Mr. So, um, but from my perspective is that uh, police won't be seeking an extension to any of the orders, but it will at the end of the day be a matter for government, particularly the health minister who owns the individual orders. Okay, but what's your understanding about the current uh, end time of the public health orders? I would imagine they all have different end dates. We do have a list of those to ensure that we continue to retrain New South Wales police officers to use uh, those laws effectively. Okay. Um, I might ask about the enforcement. Can you give the committee a sort of a sense of how the enforcement uh, function has, has gone? So, regardless of the lead up to the construction of the health orders, Health General Council would correspond to New South Wales Police General Council. We would then operationalise each order uh, and then we would engage in training uh, for New South Wales Police officers. Uh, before the date and time of enactment. Okay. And um, has your officers received any particular or special training in relation to enforcement of the orders, or is it just part of their uh, general duties functions? So their fact sheets have been created, uh, additional information for briefings. You know, I myself have cut uh, videos uh, for policing in terms of, you know, generally showing high uh, levels of discretion in relation to using the tickets and, you know, where possible uh, work with the community as the community were working with us. But there were fact sheets and information created for each of the health orders to ensure that police had as much information as available. We also had the Police Operations Centre established 24-7 and it was clear to officers if they were unsure in terms of what action to take, they would contact the Police Operations Centre and seek advice from more senior staff and or police prosecutors. And Commissioner, did the New South Wales Police issue standard operating procedures in relation to breaches of the public health orders? There were certainly fact sheets and information in terms of the powers and what the powers meant from a policing perspective. Um, I can't recall if they were determined to be SOPs, but there was certainly information provided to police on the individual powers. And they were issued centrally rather than no, region region. Region. I'm sorry, we spoke over each other. Could you say that again? I was just asking if they were issued, all issued centrally rather than region by region. Uh, they were issued centrally. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you were indicating you don't know whether standing operating procedures were issued for the public health orders. Can you take that on notice and come back to us? Uh, I, I, I am certain that we issued correspondence to police in relation to how to use the individual powers. What that form was called, I am unsure. But we certainly issued training material to police on how to use the powers. Okay, can we have copies of that correspondence or any uh, documents that I'm might or might not be standard? Thank you. Thank you. Um, in relation to the uh, infringements that have been issued to date, as of today or yesterday, can you tell us how many infringements have been issued? It was around 
1,300, uh, slightly over 1,300 infringements. Um, and if you compare that with Victoria, who are up to 5,600, I think New South Wales police have used their powers extremely sparingly. Uh, yes. Um, in relation to the infringements, I think you'd said on a number of occasions that they were issued in circumstances where uh, persons concerned had refused police directions on a number of occasions. Is that the case for all of them or were there some first offenders, as it were, issued in infringements and in what circumstances? Certainly be a mix of first offenders and there would be a mix of those who had been given multiple warnings. Um, look, an example, there were four men drinking in a park. Uh, the men were asked to leave. Three men left and received no tickets. The one who refused to leave was given a ticket. Um, I think that's an example of where police were doing their best to use the powers in a measured way. And I, and I think uh, in most cases, I believe that will be the case. Okay. Do you know whether the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research is collecting statistics on the issue of fines for breaches of public health orders? Or are you, is, is your force keep, keeping those statistics? Well, the Bureau of Crime Statistics, when it comes to crime, utilises our base system. So, uh, you know, they are certainly have the ability to do that. Uh, we haven't asked them, but if a Member of Parliament or the Secretary asked the Bureau of Crime Statistics to collect information, then that is certainly possible. Okay. Um, how many of the infringements are were directed to individuals and how many to premises or businesses? I'll take it to notice, include? but the business tickets were a very small percentage of the overall infringements. Okay. And can you give us a sense of what sort of things those infringements were for? Yeah, look, I think of... the first couple of days there were restaurants that stayed open even though that they were closed by definition under the Health Act. But that certainly seen, that message really got through to businesses that were closed very quickly and we didn't see an ongoing trend in businesses breaching the health orders. I, I note your... Um comments about the Victoria New South Wales comparison, and that is uh, helpful. Commissioner, do you anticipate the fines tapering off at the moment? Is that the pattern at the moment of those? Yeah, well, I think you should look at the, the Easter long weekend was quite a busy weekend for tickets. Um, and since then, it has tapered off significantly, which I think is a great thing. And do you anticipate that will continue to be the case? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's multiple reasons for that. I think most of the community are supportive of, of the way the New South Wales Police and the way the government's been handling the, the pandemic. But I think at the same time, you have the Premier, um, you know, relaxing restrictions, uh, which, you know, even that by definition would mean there would be less and less people likely to breach the health orders. Can you give us some sense of the amount of fines uh, issued in the city versus the country? Uh, it yep. did seem that early on, despite the low risk of virus transmission in the in country New South Wales, that a number of these uh, offences were being registered there early on. Have you got any so if, if uh, you statistics the... on that balance or any views on that? Yeah, question? so you, you, the, the state is cut up into six regions. There are three metropolitan and there are three regional. If you accept that Western Region is a huge part of the state, I think they received around 140 tickets. Central Med Region, which, which is really the centre of Sydney, received 361. So, you know, just based on that, and I'm happy to again take it on notice for more detailed information, is the Western Region that, from by size, is more than half the state, received nearly a third of what the city did. Mm. So, yeah, if you could take those figures on notice, that'd be helpful. Uh, but are you, you're personally comfortable that um, despite the lower risk in the regions, uh, the fines there were proportionate to the behaviour that was being seen? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do. And I, and I think you need to remember that, you know, lots of police responded 
to these calls from members of the community who were unhappy that people weren't coming on the journey. So we received lots and lots of calls to Crime Stoppers by decent people who were doing the right thing. Um, you know, not, not all of these tickets of police out walking through parks looking for offenders. Is that you know, many of these came as a byproduct of the community being unhappy. Um, th thanks for that, Commissioner. Just just on that issue of um, those fines being issued in in the Western Region, can you tell us what kind of behaviours uh, attracted those fines? I mean, I know it was travelling without lawful excuses, often the descriptor, but I just wondered whether you had uh, a slightly uh, fuller flavour of the kind of behaviours that were attracting this. But most of them were being out of home without a reasonable excuse, you know, i.e. You know, drinking in the park type offences. Um, there were times that we caught, you know, people engaged in, say, dealing drugs or breaking into a house. So. There's a whole range of reasons. I don't have that list in front of me, but in terms of a broad flavour, uh, Mr. Searle, we're certainly happy to take on notice for the Western Region 140 to give you some sense of what breaches under the Health Act they were for. Certainly, and uh, again, on notice, uh, if you could uh, provide a sense of, in different parts of the state, including the city, what kind of behaviours were attracting the infringements? Yeah, I, I, I could do it certainly under the different health uh, actual orders. Um, it yes. would, would be impossible to pull apart. To, it would take weeks and weeks. So I, I will provide that information in terms of the health orders, the individual. You. Um, you mentioned Crime Stoppers being the source of. Uh, some police uh, attention to individuals. Uh, how many calls were made to Crime Stoppers regarding public health order breaches? Um, I'll take it on notice, but it was into the thousands, is my understanding. Okay. And I, I, again, I, 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 I'll those... take it on notice, but I believe it was up near 17,000 calls, exactly. which is enormous. Okay. And um, how many of those calls, and I'm happy for you to take it on notice, resulted in a police attendance at a particular location or to dealing with a, a particular concern? I'm happy for you to take that on notice as well. Thank you, David. Um, I think at one press conference or a number of press conferences, you indicated that you were personally reviewing uh, the infringements that had been issued. Can you just clarify what it was you were reviewing? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Searle. I get a summary of each ticket, uh, and and if I think it's reasonable, the individual, you know, that the example I gave you, where there are four men in the park drinking, and the three men left, and I didn't get a ticket, but the one who refused to go did, then I'm I'm happy with that. Um, there are others that I got that I asked for more information because. Uh, on the summary I got, I wasn't happy to endorse or not endorse it. Um, but the reality is I would get a three or four line summary in terms of the general gist of the ticket. If I thought it was reasonable, then that was fine. If it's not, I asked for more information. Okay, and so that's for the whole, the whole 1300. That's quite a, an onerous responsibility. Yeah, look, I, I wanted the community to believe that New South Wales Police uh, we're using the powers um, sparingly. And the reality is that they're important powers during the largest emergency that I'm likely to see. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't want the New South Wales police and the community to be divided over the, the powers. Uh, fair enough. Um, how many fines did you determine should not proceed or should be cancelled? I think organisationally we're up to about 60 fines were pulled and I think the first one I, I pulled was a lady dropping off a hair straightener to a friend um, and, and you know I thought to myself that, that probably we got that wrong and, and so there's examples throughout that where I felt as though that, that, that you know we had probably interpreted it a little too uh, 
specific and and so again there was around 50 to 60 that we have withdrawn either through my concerns or concerns through that chain of command um commissioner can i just ask you and i'm happy for you to take this one on notice how many you mentioned earlier that um some individuals were issued with uh public health infringement notices on top of other charges are you able to tell us how many of those were were as a result of addition the infringement notices were given um in combination with other charges i, I will take on notice I'm, I'm sure we can probably provide that information thanks very much um, uh, Commissioner, did you personally review the fine issued to the Honourable Don Harbin, MLC? That came as part of a summary uh, with the other tickets issued on that day, yes. Okay. And, and again, this, in terms of your review of the, the infringements issued, did you have any uh, guidelines that you had put together for yourself or any sort of set of criteria about when you would uh, proceed with the with the infringement or the circumstances in which you might have them withdrawn. Um, I applied the same guideline as as police would be trained. Okay, so it's the general exercise of police discretion. Absolutely, as uh, well as the general intent of of the individual health orders. Uh, of course, now of course you'd have to be guided by the health orders uh, themselves. Um, all right, so. And in relation to the exercise of the discretion given to your officers, is that the same? Um, would they be generally guided by the, 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 the orders themselves plus their general discretion or common sense? Yeah, look, and I shot a number of videos for the troops, you know, and I asked them to, to use their powers of discretion wisely. Uh, and, and I ask them to be confident in using discretion where possible and I feel it probably played a fairly large role in our infringements being a, you know, a, a quarter of what Victorian polices are. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner. I've had a, a couple of questions about enforcement going forward. Um, will police be enforcing the um, new guidelines around public transport? So, I, when you talk about social distancing and hygiene, they are only good health advice. They've, they've never been in an order. So, if I was to put my arm around the minister, I'm not breaking any laws. Now, it's a bad look and it's a bad message to everyone who's trying their best to isolate and, and use hygiene. So, in terms of buses, um, if, if a bus company or, or Transport New South Wales has determined that only a certain amount of people can get on a train or a bus, then that would be up to them to manage that. Now, if there was a public order issue as a byproduct of, um, you know, only certain amount of people being allowed, then police would be called. But it, it is not mine, I've been clear on this, this is not my intention for New South Wales police to be standing at doors counting people, etc. What normally happens, we end up there as a byproduct of people being happy or unhappy with the restrictions that are put in place. Okay, and then so if someone on a work site was unhappy with the social distancing situation, would would you consider that you have jurisdiction for that as well? Can I tell you, we, we haven't been called as far as I know or issued any tickets oh, for the site, for again, just to be go clear. Go. I will take that on notice, but I got an inquiry earlier that police were policing work sites. We couldn't find one ticket or one interaction on actually on a work site. Um, so if, if we're called down to a work site, um, I, I can't see what role police would play in social distancing. Again, it's just health advice. There, there's no laws to uh, for police to give someone a ticket for standing too close to another person. We're, we're going to move now so to the crossbench because the opposition's first round has expired. Mr. Borzak. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome, Minister. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you very much. 
was a bit difficult getting started, but we're on our way. Um, Minister, it was reported on the 29th of March that the Premier asked Commissioner Fuller to take the additional role as State Emergency Operations Controller only the previous afternoon, i.e. Saturday the 28th of March. Did the Premier speak with you before asking the Commissioner to uh, take up that role? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. She did? Okay, thank you. Uh, did you have any reservations about the Commissioner taking on that ad additional responsibility? No, that's uh, the, the job normally goes to uh, uh, senior police. And how would you characterise the way the process has worked? First class. Sorry, first class. Okay, thank you. Is there any way that we could have actually improved the process of managing uh, the uh, the enforcement side of things? Uh, well, after every operation, they normally do um, uh, a, a POR, and when this operation is concluded, I suspect. We'll do a debrief and uh, we'll check our SOPs and we'll check our C2 and all the other um, management techniques that combat agencies use. And um, I'd be very surprised if uh, if we didn't come up trumps, but I'd also be very surprised if uh, if we aren't considered world's best practice when you consider like-minded jurisdictions and, and where they are. Yeah, look, I, t I think I tend to agree with you that the, the process in New South Wales has been handled pretty well. Um, do you have a view on whether such a long suspension of Parliament was indeed necessary? Not my call. Not your call? You don't have a view? Okay. Minister, do you have a view on the closure of New South Wales borders, which is still persisting, for example, with Queensland? Well, we haven't closed our borders. The, the other states haven't closed theirs. Yeah, that's right. But I'm saying I can't speak you... for the other premiers. I, it, it could, our Gladys has said that it's unnecessary, and I would certainly agree with that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, there's been some uh, criticism and concerns regarding confusion and mixed messages from the government on what is and isn't permit a permitted activity. Um, have you had any input into the decisions in which activities are and are not permitted? No, uh, no Mr Borzak, but I, I've certainly been doing my best to educate New South Wales police uh, as best as possible. I mean, this has been a challenging time, Mr Borzak. I, I have to say that is that new laws are being struck quickly, uh, you know, but I, I think the community and, and the police have realised that it's a you know, it's a global pandemic, it is serious. Um, so for mine, it's been more about working through the health orders uh, and trying to complement the Premier's communication by ensuring that you know, we're enforcing it uh, in the best interest that the health orders were struck. Thank you. Um, it's obviously, it's been a difficult period and obviously it's ongoing. Is there any way we could have done anything better from your point of view? I think it was a sensible escalation from an emergency perspective. Um, we, we have bushfires and floods, um, and, and you know we learn from those every year. But but there was nothing really like this to compare it to, Mr. Borzak. Um, and, and I think that health with a combat agency, um, the state emergency operations centre stood up in support of it, but, but it quickly turned into an operation. Um, that health aren't an expert in. Now, New South Wales Health do an amazing job, but they're, they're not great at logistics, they're not great at security. There were, the operation was moving into an area that wasn't their area of expertise. And the Premier could have called a state of emergency that would have caused a lot of stress for a lot of people, but the alternative was to write to health uh, and for New South Wales Police to take the combat agency role. And I think that happened in fairly good time. Now, at some stage, Mr. Borzak, that we will hand the combat agency status back to health once the health orders are gone. And, and this is just about our ICU bed capability and, and how we message and, and, and protect the health of the people. I'm sure there will be lessons learned. But if you look at the, the escalation from sort of early January, you know, I, I think that the agencies have done a very good job, particularly 
you've got to go back probably a hundred years to benchmark it to anything similar. Well, that, that's interesting you raise that. Are there any records available from what happened in those in those times? And, and if so, what role did police have in those days? Yeah, an interesting one. There, there was a, a, a actual minister who took on the enforcement role within cabinet. His surname was Fuller, the irony of it, but he's not related <laughs> to me as far as I know. This is a true story. So there is an old, there is an old chart and there is some information around people being fined for not wearing masks. Um, the structure is, is fairly similar. Happy to provide you that structure on notice. Yeah, please, it'd be interesting. Uh, uh, it, did it inform you in any way? Um, look, look I, I, when you look at the groupings that Cabinet established back in those days, noting that emergency management wasn't matured like it is today, they actually had very similar groupings that we have in it today around communication, around dealing with the emergency, around trying to come up with a vaccine, uh, around enforcement played a, a big role in that as well. And, you know, I think it was a it was a fairly hefty fine too. I know it was pounds and pounds for being fined for not complying with the health orders of the day. Um, you know, you know there, there wasn't a, a debrief document per se to read, but certainly the all chart was very interesting. Thank you. Um, I noticed you had a, well, obviously in your role, you had an extensive uh, interaction on the Ruby Princess and what was going on with it. Um, how would you characterise or outline your role in that incident? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Borzak. Um, I, I was tasked by the Premier in the role as the Senior Emergency Operations Controller to conduct a, a review into what evidence was available. Uh, and I was given a, around a 48 hour period to do that. Um, you know, I listened to a number of AAA calls, uh, some logs and emails between the Ports Authority and uh, Carnival. Uh, and there was an uh, independent report uh, commissioned by Health. Um, so I just used those documents to try to draw a conclusion on what needs to happen next. I, I felt as though that there were potentially some criminal questions that need answering. Uh, so by the Sunday, if you accept that the Premier announced it on a Thursday, uh, by the Sunday I'd finished my review and announced a criminal investigation. Uh, that team was stood up on the Monday, uh, briefed and information was handed over to them. Around seven days on from that, uh, Mr Borzak, I informed the Premier that uh, this, this matter involved thousands and thousands of witnesses that it would take months and months and months. And, and I think most people would understand rushing a criminal investigation is usually unhelpful of that size. Um, and, and then shortly after that, the Premier announced a special commission uh, into the Ruby Princess. But if, from my perspective, I conducted a short investigation as a senior emergency operations controller, I handed that over on the Monday and then really it was about dealing with the crew, which is about 1,040 crew members, uh, and then working with a whole range of stakeholders about uh, you know, moving around 14 ships off the New South Wales coast back to their port of origin, including the Ruby Princess. Yeah, I noticed you issued orders eventually for the other ships to leave. They weren't, I, I guess the message was they weren't going to be allowed to dock, so they had to go where they were going to go, whether it was home port or elsewhere. Um, Commissioner, you've got a lessons learned unit. Would it, this um, uh, project, if you like to call it that, uh, go in there for a, a detailed review? No, the, the, the lessons learned unit is probably looks at more individual powers. Um, but this would be you know, more of a whole of government review. It would be very difficult for police on their own to lead a review into a health emergency. Um, now, in saying that, we could always review the way the police enacted in the emergency. We could certainly uh, do that. Um, but in terms of the whole 
emergency with very few conflicts for police to lead a whole of government review uh, for a health operation. Oh, thanks, Mr. Borzak. I think that round of questioning has expired. We'll, we'll come back to you in the Thank next you. round. Uh, Minister Commissioner, nice to see you both. Um, Commissioner, are you still undertaking that role of reviewing um, each infringement notice that's been issued in accordance with yep. your previous Every statements? morning I get an Excel sort of spreadsheet uh, with the ticket and about three or four lines in relation to what the basic offence was. But as, you, as I think it was noted, there was only a, a couple over the last couple of days, so it's not exactly uh, a time-consuming role at the moment. But but you're still undertaking that role on a daily basis. Yeah, I get the Excel spreadsheet brought, put on my desk first thing with the stats from overnight, and and as you can imagine, at the same time every day, you know when new powers come about, police are using them uh, and using their discretion better and better every day. So I don't think I've had to pull one now for a week or so. Um, so how many have you personally pulled out um, and indicated? that you thought on the face of it were inappropriate? Yeah, certainly early in the piece. I think the first six or eight uh, I did personally. Then as it's evolved, I guess the people through the chain started to get a feel for, you know, my expectations. So I'd say probably one in 10 after the first 10 were pulled by me and the rest were done during the course of the reviews coming to me, if that makes sense. Um, well, look, I understand that, that the number that you've pulled out have reduced over time. Is that what you're telling me, the proportion? Because if you understand that someone collects the data on the tickets and they give it to a, a sergeant uh, and then that goes to my staff officer. So over the course of time, you know, people understand what I think is acceptable and what's not. So early in the piece, most of them were, were pulled by me. But as the process went, is that they were getting pulled on the basis that, you know, my chief They're being caught, caught in the system for yeah. review before yeah, they got to Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, uh, have you ensured that you're on top of what the current set of public health orders are so you can do that review process? For example, um, I think Mr Searle asked you some questions about the effect of the um, most recent public health order. Are you, are you aware of what the effect of the most recent public health order is? So we get the health orders. So they come, again, just to explain that Police General Council and Health General Council work, then police have to operationalise how that will be enforced before the time and date that gets switched on. Um, but, but that comes to me, yes. So um, what's your understanding of the current obligations in terms of needing a reasonable excuse or not to leave a property. What's your current understanding, Commissioner? To, to leave a property? Well, that to has leave your home. been uh, relaxed uh, since the emergency has started. Initially, it was really around essential. Uh, now you can go shopping for anything. Um, you know, the Deputy Premier had been clear that Travelling to country New South Wales wasn't essential. So, you know, in terms of where we started from the first order being struck and the intent of the orders, um, there is certainly, you know, plenty of reasonable excuses to be out now. So are you saying it's, it's your position as the most senior police officer in the state that people still require a reasonable excuse to be out and about? Is that your position? Um, no, because really they could come up with any reasonable excuse at the moment. So what I'm saying is that there are businesses that are closed. So if you're out of your home and you've gone and opened up, uh, you know, a premises that's closed, then clearly that's not a reasonable excuse. So Sorry, are you, you have saying, to overlay are you saying, it with the activity. You know, I mean, just saying a reasonable excuse. So, you know, if you said pubs and clubs, um, a couple of weeks ago were closed. So if you went to a pub or a club and you opened it up and you were drinking, then that's not a reasonable excuse to be out. So you're saying you're still directing New South Wales Police to be checking for reasonable excuse. And it's your understanding 
if, if so I'm some mistaken, that you no, think there's no, still, no, no, let me finish the question, right. Commissioner. That, it works better if we talk one at a time. Are, are you suggesting that people still require a reasonable excuse to be out and about? That's, that's your understanding of the law at the moment. Can you ask the question again? Well, as I understand it, you, you now seem to be suggesting that there's a broader range of reasonable excuses that people can apply. And that's your understanding of the public health orders at the moment. Am I, am I wrong in that? So, so I would say that in terms of the intent is that until that there is a uh, vaccine for corona, is that the advice and guidance in terms of, uh, you know, particularly people who are elderly who are unwell, is that being home and being in isolation is going to be the best, uh, you know, it can. But the reality is that, you know, things such as, you know, 10 people now can visit someone's home. So, sorry, it said 10 people can be out in a public gathering. Uh, now, if there's 20 people out training together, then it's a breach of the health C Commissioner, so, Commissioner, this is not a trick question. It's just your understanding as the most senior police officer in New South Wales, do people require a reasonable excuse to be out and about under the public health orders? Not a trick question. What's your understanding? But you, ha you, you can't detach this from gatherings and closures. You're, you're well, I'm asking to, about the obligation on individuals, the out. obligation on individuals, the obligation on individuals, Commissioner. It's not a trick question. It's a very simple question. It's a very obvious question. What's your understanding? Well, you can't just ask that question in isolation. Well, I just take it on notice so I'll your give you a legal answer. I'll take it on notice and give you a legal answer. Well, Commissioner, you should know, you should know, and, and I'm, I'm interested in how it is you don't know, that the obligation to have a reasonable excuse was revoked with the public health order, the most recent public health order that came into force last Friday. How is it you don't know that basic fundamental? How is it you don't know that basic fundamental? As I said to you, you overlay it with the other restrictions, uh, and that's been clear. I said that. I said that if you know anyone can go out to shop, anyone can go and do A, they can do B. But you can't be in a pub or club at that certain time. If there's more than 10 people training, then, then that's not reasonable. So you need to overlay that with the messaging and the other orders that are in place. Commissioner, I suggest, and I'm happy for you to respond, I suggest that you don't know what the current state of play is in terms of the public health orders. And I suggest to you that that's a pretty major shortcoming for the New South Wales Commissioner of Police. What do you say to that? So you're wrong. Well, Commissioner, you would have reviewed the fine that was issued by the police um, at 9.30 p.m. on Friday the 15th of May, according to police, the police media unit, um, to an individual from, who, from Emu Plains, a 19-year-old man who was issued with a $1,000 fine by your police on Friday. And the reason was he didn't have a reasonable excuse for leaving home. Now, you would have reviewed that. You obviously would have ticked off on that. But yet there was no obligation for him to have a reasonable excuse. How did this happen? I'll take it on notice. Thank you. Commissioner, don't you think that you should know what the obligations are under the public health order before, before you review them? How can you be reviewing them if you I'm don't actually know what's in them? I'm comfortable. Well, Commissioner, there, there are people watching this and they're interested to know what kind of guidance are being given to police for enforcing the public health orders. Well, the fact that we've what only issued 1,300 tickets and people? other states and territories have issued four or five times that. We're using the powers extremely well. Maybe you've been watching the wrong news position, Bridge. Maybe you should watch you New don't, South you Wales don't understand. They're talking well, over is not normal, Mr. Shoebridge. Well, I, I thought you had finished. If you have more to add about your understanding of the reasonable excuse requirements, please, please add it now. So if, if you, at, at different points in different times, the health orders have been switched on and switched off. So trying to take a point in time is not as simple as that. We know the health orders have been amended. Uh, and from my perspective, the New South Wales Police has done an outstanding job applying powers in a very difficult situation, taken so seriously that the Commissioner of Police is reviewing them. Other states and territories followed my lead in relation to that. 
if we have got one or two wrong, then I hope those people take them to court. They can write letters to have them withdrawn. There's still a whole range of legal processes, but the fact that we've issued so few tickets, I think it's embarrassing that it was taken up so much of my time this morning. Uh, Minister, do you, is it your understanding that people still require a reasonable excuse to be leaving their homes? Is that your understanding as a police minister? Well, you just have to go, before you ask those questions, David, have, just go and read the, um, the health orders because they're, they're, they're pretty clear. We don't issue the health orders. We just ensure that they're complied with. And, and I really object to the way that you've just treated the commissioner in the line of questioning just as much as I really object to the way that you spoke to my staff before we came on uh, and you'll be getting a letter of complaint from me for the bullying that you did to my staff earlier on. So how about you just change and adjust your attitude and maybe you'll get a bit more out of people. Well, perhaps if you understood the Public Health Orders Minister and you could tell us what they mean, that would have well, the people I, of New I South Wales. Well, but no, if you don't, if you don't, we'll move on to the opposition. I'll give you a last chance and then we'll move on to the opposition. The Health Minister issues the health orders. Yes, uh, the opposition. I think you have to unmute yourself. Um, 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 can you hear me now? Yep. Good. Um, in relation to the health orders made on 30 March, um, and this is a question either to the minister or to the commissioner, I'm happy for either to take it. Um, the health orders made on 30 March made it very clear in clause five that no one was to leave their residence without a reasonable excuse. It was a Sorry, schedule no. of some 16 reasonable excuses. It wasn't exhaustive. You could add to it depending on the circumstances, and that's understandable. The new health order made on 14 May revokes that earlier health order. It's not an amendment. It's a revocation which replaces it. It doesn't have any blanket prohibition on leaving the place of residence. There's a series of other things it deals with, but I just want to get clear because, Minister, you know, your administration and the Commissioner's force is responsible for enforcing the law. It's the case, isn't it, that you no longer need to have a reasonable excuse to leave your place of residence? Well, I'm just trying to get that. Sorry, it's a, it's a, it, can you just repeat the back end of the question? It's a case of what, sorry? You no longer need to have a reasonable excuse to leave your residence now. The law has changed since 14 May. Well, that's a that's question you've asked. Isn't it? It, well, I, you know I don't issue the health orders, don't you? Well, I do, but your administration and the police force is responsible for enforcing the law. So you're referring I'm just to trying to my... understand whether what your understanding of the current law is. Well, I mean, did you refer to the 30th of April health orders, did you? No, 30, 30 March was when the substantive health orders were made and there's new health orders made 14 May, which yeah. revokes them and, remakes yeah. and replaces them. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, if, I'm reading, if I'm understanding your question, you're asking about the 14th of May public health order yeah. effective the 15th yeah. of May. Yeah, and it, essentially. And it says the order revoked and remakes the public health order of 2022 ease certain restrictions in particular and then it goes from yes. A to uh, um, to G. Yeah. So, so so there's a range of things the new order deals with, like requiring employers to allow A2, A2, to M, work from home. Um, but there's no longer a blanket prohibition on people having to stay home, is there? Well as the commission has said, I mean most most people but that's probably a mute point because most people would probably be able to identify. I mean, only really stupid people saying they're out to collect, to collect drugs would probably be able to identify um, a reason for being out from A to M. But can I just um, can I just remind the committee that um, the, the, the basic sentiment from from the state government, from every other government around the world is that because COVID-19 is so, uh, um, uh, is such a, um, is such a dangerous uh, uh, disease that um, 
it's in your best interest not to unnecessarily be exposed to other people and to be exposed to it. So, yes, we have these health orders. Yes, we have public messages. And as as uh, as the premier and the deputy premier and the prime minister repeatedly said, um, uh, you know, we're trying to make it business as usual as much as possible. But um, we're not, these aren't to punish people, and I get the impression, certainly by the, the line of questioning from um, your colleague from the Greens, that this is some sort of police punishment. It's, it's not. We're actually making oh, well, sure. No, no, people... no, Minister, Minister, I'm a, these are my questions. I'm pretty keen to finish I'm my answer, that but that if you don't want me to finish, I won't answer any more of yours. So the, the government, like the police, are very, very keen for people to actually understand the spirit of the law and the spirit of, of, of these, these health orders is to keep people safe. Uh, yes, we've now identified, as um, we've just uh, discussed, the, the 14th of May public health order, and it outlines a whole range of reasons for people um, that, uh, also the easing of those restrictions. And let's not let the line of questioning remove uh, the uh, the intent of the government, the, which is to keep people safe and to limit their exposure to COVID-19. Well, that's rather the point of my question, Minister. This is a, a potentially lethal virus. Uh, I'm fully conscious of the health risks. I'm just lethal. wondering. It's I'm just wondering why why the, uh, the the blanket prohibition on leaving the home other than with a reasonable excuse has been removed well do you can you you're a minister you have to ask the can, health you, can, you, can you can you explain that you have to ask the health minister that i don't um i don't issue okay. the orders and he okay. takes it on advice from the chief medical officer okay well i guess my question to you and to commissioner fuller is you do understand that that is the change, that is the most significant change in these new health orders. Again, that people any now questions relating to the health orders, leave the home for any reason. Any questions relating to the health orders, you've really got to direct to um, no, no. my other colleague, the Minister for Health, and but, he will no doubt be taking advice um, on all those answers from the Chief Medical Officer. But, but, but please don't get, let, let the police force and myself get mixed up with the health orders because we don't, no, no, we don't make decisions about how they're issued. Our, our, our role is to make sure that they're complied with. Sorry, well, I understand that. I understand that that is your role. You do that understand is the role because of the commissioner. you can't questions that you should have asked the Brad. Well, no, we'll, we'll be inviting him back to ask some further questions. The point of this question, Minister, is, is this. Yes, it is the role of the police commissioner and the police force to enforce the law. I'm just exploring what your understanding or what Commissioner Fuller's understanding of the law is. Commissioner, well, you are aware that this is a fundamental is change in the health orders? I'm sorry? I'm just asking the Commissioner whether he understands the new health orders contain a fundamental change. That is, people no longer have a blanket prohibition on leaving their home except with a reasonable excuse. Is that your What's understanding it? of the law? Yeah, I, I, I thought I answered it clearly, but I don't think Mr. Shubridge understood me. What, what my point was that you could leave home for just about anything is what I said. But what I overlaid that with is that there's still other things that people are prohibited from doing. And that is if you had a wedding with 20 people, then there's 10 people would be getting a ticket. So um, trying to peel away the health orders, they often overlap and complement each other. But on top of that, you still have messaging from health experts that, that the safest place will be at home, and that will be an ongoing issue until uh, either the virus is gone or there is uh, you know, some sense of a cure for it. So there's two things in this. There's sensible health advice, and then there are the health orders. And I think people will be confused across the two. Now, if there's evidence that the police have got one of these 1,200 tickets wrong, then I'm happy to receive information from that and rescind it. But it certainly isn't a trend in what I'm seeing in the tickets. Hmm. Uh, with, with respect, Commissioner, you, you couldn't leave home for just about anything. There were, there were limitations on 
why you could leave home. Uh, and most of the, in fact, all of the infringements issued prior to 15 May were, I think, for people not having a reasonable excuse. That has now all fallen away in the new orders. And I'm just wanting to make sure that that, that reflects your understanding of the law you've been asked to enforce. Yes, it does. But as I was trying to explain, is that the tickets that we are seeing, uh, you know, for people who are breaching other orders in relation to that. So um, I accept what you are saying is fact. And, uh, Minister, I might just ask you, you're a Minister of the Crown, you're enforcing with the Commissioner of the Law of the Land. This is pretty confusing, though, for the citizens. If I'm leaving home, do I need a reasonable excuse or not? Uh, well, I'm referring to the public health orders that the health minister signed off. Yes, but you're well, well, give me a scenario. Give me a scenario. So again, that's this is not the, about the content of the health orders. We would direct those questions to the health minister. Yeah, yeah. You're responsible for enforcing them. Do give I me a need scenario. a reasonable excuse or not? Give me a scenario. I mean, if, if you're leaving home and the, and the minister. If, if group, Mate, just put it on notice if you're going to interrupt me. No, I'll, I'll give you a scenario. I'm leaving my house. No, don't worry about it. Just put it on notice excuse. because I'm just not going to be interrupted, right? I'm just sick of it. Just put it on notice. Well, Minister, I'll, I'll ask you one more time. If I'm leaving my house, do I need a reasonable excuse? You do if you're going to go to the regional areas at that time. And this is where I think you know, you're splitting hairs on this is that, you know, you leave home with a reasonable excuse, but end up in the country, then you're probably going to get a ticket. So, you know, I, I think that the low level of tickets and the high level of compliance, I think the community absolutely have been on board with the health orders. I think there's just a philosophical argument that they're draconian and we all accept that and we'll all be happy when they're gone. Something that was um, that was some that was similar. Um, there is no rule book on pandemic. Yes, it's been exercised by the combat agencies on occasion, and of course there is a, a state health plan. But um, uh, it is, I mean, when you consider what the Labor government of Victoria have done to its population, and you consider what we've done here in New South Wales, and then you compare it with the number of people that have been both booked and exposed to the virus. Um, I think your attempt to uh, criticise the health minister and the premier in their management, or the police commissioner for that matter, uh, is just blatantly political. And um, I think you'll be, uh, I think that, uh, I think you'll be judged accordingly. Minister, I'm not, I, I'm not directing this question to the premier, to the health minister or to the commissioner. I'm asking you uh, about your understanding of the law. I want to follow the law. I want to leave my house. Do I need a reasonable excuse in New South Wales? The just answered that. But why, why would you? Why, why, why? First of all, um, the message not to leave house is not a punishment. It's to stop you from getting coronavirus and then spreading it to your family and loved ones. But secondly, when you have people out and the police pull them up and they say, oh, mate, I was out getting my drugs. Um, well then, yeah. Guess what? That's not a reasonable excuse. Uh, and uh, and I think that uh, no matter which way you want to spin it, mate, it's going to be considered as a, a reason for people to get a ticket. Do you understand when you give that answer that a citizen of New South Wales trying to follow the law might find this pretty confusing, Minister? Well, uh, pretty sure a citizen who goes to get drugs during a pandemic might be asking for it. Well, what about the millions of ordinary citizens trying to follow the law, Minister? Well, can you just provide them some clarity? This is quite remarkable, frankly. Yeah, OK, just refer them to the health orders if somebody asks you about the, um, uh, about, uh, the implementation of it. Well, well, Minister, that's not satisfactory. People want to be kept safe. They want to follow the law. They assume the law they are is following the law. to what will keep them safe. Please don't interrupt me, Minister. They are following they the law. law. I don't, know, I don't right. know how you think that you, you, can, you, can, you can spin this Minister, as a negative Minister, law. The police force sorry, sorry, Minister. Let's all issue a 400 tickets compared to, what, 5,000, 6,000 in Victoria. I'm pretty comfortable that they're following the law. Mr. Sirlin, Minister. 
this will work much better, as you've indicated before, Minister, if people don't talk over each other, but that's a two-way street. So if I could ask the witnesses and the, um, and the members to ensure that they don't talk over each other. I, I think Mr Sell was halfway through his question. Th thank you, Mr Chair. Minister, let's be very clear here. I don't say the public health orders are draconian. I'm not saying they've been misused. I'm just trying to understand what is being what is what is being required here. I understand there is the orders. I understand that uh, the premier and the police commissioner and other people have provided commentary on what people should do, but people look to what is in the orders to what is safe and what will keep them away from uh, in infection and keep them safe. I'm just trying to understand what your knowledge of the law is and what you say should be enforced. Um, and it seems to me that you don't have a very firm grasp on what the public health orders are actually requiring. And that obviously sends oh, a clear signal to the community. I take that as an opinion because uh, the orders are updated every day, but more to the point, the fact that we have had, as the minister, when I turn to the commissioner and, and I'm told that the fact that we've had so few infringements are against uh, health orders that are, that are changed every day are very, very complex in the sense that they are, are, have never been I've never been implemented in living memory. I think we're doing pretty well. And the mere fact that we are re we are in a position to ease restrictions um, so early, uh, and as the Deputy Premier said, I mean, Christmas has come early for us because these restrictions were expected to be going on into the spring. I think that you're clutching at straws. I think that uh, it's trying to be blatantly political. And I think when you start to try to um, uh, make scenarios clearly just don't exist uh you're um are you pr providing you're providing some anxiety in the community that we well, claim that there's anxiety in the community, community that clearly isn't even there no minister you're you're willfully misunderstanding you, you're right in saying some restrictions have been flagged and i'm just getting you to accept in, in this public forum that one of those restrictions is people no longer need a reasonable excuse to leave the home Okay, that, well, I'm just referring to the place. health orders that you just identified on the 5th of May. Okay. So. I'll, I'll have a slight change of topic. In relation to the public health orders made on 14 May, um, there is still a prohibition on going to a regional area. Um, I think it was the Deputy Premier flagged that that was going to change by 1 June. Now, you're a minister in the government. Is that your understanding of what is likely to be? Have to ask the Deputy Premier. Well, then, he's already a, uh, oh, Well, I'm not going to preempt announcements that, are, that may not be made yet. Well, I, I might have misunderstood, but I'm pretty sure the Deputy Premier and the Premier the day before yesterday stood up and said from 1 June, you, you will be able to travel to regional New South Wales. Is that now not the case? Well, you just told me that it's the case. Yeah, there was an announcement yesterday. Yes. Um, so you would expect, would you, that the public health orders then, clause nine in the new public health order made out just a few days ago, would no, wouldn't be enforced, or would you expect it to be okay. changed? I'm just going to ignore any further questions about the public health orders because you clearly haven't heard that I don't issue them. They're issued oh, by I, Brad. I do understand that. You've, had Brad, you've had Brad before the committee. You obviously haven't thought to answer ask these questions of the health minister, but you can still put them on notice to him. So I would encourage well, you to well, do minister, that. Minister, minister, you know well and good that Mr Hazard came here before these new public health orders were made. So I put them on notice. Now, the, new public health, the new public health order says the minister directs that a person must not take a holiday in a regional area. That is the law that Commissioner Fuller must enforce. Now, the Premier and the Deputy Premier has said from 1 June, people will be able to go to regional New South Wales. So, Commissioner, perhaps you can answer this. Where does that leave your police force? You've got the public health order you're charged with enforcing, but the Premier and Deputy Premier have said from 1 June, people can go to regional New South Wales. So, if people are at home wondering what they should do, what should they follow? The public health order? or the yeah. press announcement by the Premier and the Deputy Premier? Well, the so, I think, sorry, sir. so there's a couple of things that, Mr Sell, 
Services New South Wales, I think, should be acknowledged, have done an outstanding job in terms of messaging, and they are an important part of updating their site in terms of the orders that are in place. You know, I can see that the messaging um, about people's health can be different to the health orders um, because it's such a dangerous virus, is that the reality is if there's no outcome, no cure for this, no vaccine for this, then, you know, we, we may be living a different life for, for many years ahead. I mean, we don't know the answer to that. Um, and, and I think you're right. I think some politicians have shown great leadership and, and talked, um, you know, really tough language around health and the health of, of people. Now, have some people uh, taken that on as that's the law? I mean, I can't answer the question in relation to that. Um, we do know the health orders are relaxing. I do know that the Premier and the government, before they make these changes, give police lead time to retrain the police. We've got systems in place trying to catch it when we get it wrong. There is still a judicial process in place for people to, uh, you know, challenge the, the 1,200 infringements that have been issued. Um, you know, is it a complex space moving quickly? Yeah, absolutely it is. But I think everyone has done a bloody good job in a difficult space, Mr. Searle. I understand that, Commissioner, and don't don't misunderstand me, please. I, I'm not suggesting uh, in any way that this is not a very serious health crisis that we've been facing. I'm just looking at the public health order that you and your police force have been charged to carry out, and it says clearly you, you mustn't take a holiday in a regional area. That's okay, the law. So Adam, You're asked to enforce that. But I'm just wondering how that sits with the Premier's announcement of two days ago that from 1 June, people can do that. So on the one right, hand, you've that. got an order Sorry, asked to enforce. So with that public health order, when is it, in, when is it enforceable from? Sorry, for well, that, uh, that new policy from the 1st of June? Yeah. No, no, no. It's it, well. That was the announcement. Yes, but this is, the law is. Okay. Today, so what's today's date? Can't Adam? travel to a regional area. What's today's date? What's well, the 21st of May? That's I'm right. So, she, so, the, so Brad's got 10 days still, which is a full week, to update the public health orders. That was my. Do you think yeah, maybe we might be able to do that? Well, he may, but that's my question. At yeah, the yeah. Well, I think you just answered the... your own question, Adam. Yeah, he's got to update the health orders. Not unusual, because particularly, particularly when you're talking about travel, you've got to make sure the industry gets as much time possible in a lead way. And the bloke next to you seems to know a little bit about the hospitality industry. They need a they need a, a bit of leeway. So we'll make that announcement. The public health orders can be updated. We don't have to do them on the exact same day. Oh, I understand that, Minister. I understand that very well. I'm just exploring the fact that the public health order was made on 14 May, and by 18 May, uh, the government is giving uh, the media a drop on a very substantial change to an order that had only just been made. So I'm just wondering about that. Well, so you're well, saying the law well, will change? Lisa, we're doing well. If you don't want us to extend the health order, go out and make a, a, a statement saying that it's, you're criticising it. You don't think that we should reopen on the 1st of June. But at the moment, no, no, no. I'm just, these, these matters I'm just, are changing. These, these policies are ch and, the, and the response changes day by day. It's called an emergency. There's no, there's yeah, no, there's no understand. battle plan. There's no, there's no, um, uh, there's no uh, rule book for it. So I understand ch changes it, I'm just are drawing... happening day I'm by just... day. Now, if that doesn't it does sit well with you, I'm, I'm sorry, mate. But, but they change as regularly well, as the circumstances no, do. Start. We've gone a month ago. We had like. 212 new cases in one day. Yesterday we had two. Last week we had zero. So of course we're going to amend the public health orders. We're going to amend the restrictions to reflect the government's response. But I don't understand. One minute you're telling us that we're draconian and, and we should be we should be more we, we shouldn't be doing things or we should be doing things, and the next minute you're wanting to uh, uh, pull apart the health orders and, and the time frame. There is no, Minister, I'm there's, not, there's no I'm set not time frame. You're being, Minister, I'm not suggesting you're being draconian. I simply want to know what the law is, and you've been unable to tell us. You're the but minister in charge of right, enforcing the law. The commissioner just highlighted, if you want to know the that's law... Not the health minister. I want to know what the law is, if I want to okay, leave well then, my front door. 
and you what can't tell me. Point of order, what Chair. I would do is if you want to know the law, you do what five million other New South Welshmen and, uh, do, and that's go to Service New South Wales website and find out what the latest public health orders are. I'm going to go to Mr Khan on a point of order. Mr Thank Khan. You. Thank you, Chair. I have two points of order. The first one is... Ooh. The first point of order is that... Are you OK, Trevor? I've got a sore toe, but anyway, nobody will okay. care. <laughs> the, the first point of order is clearly Mr Graham interrupted uh, the Minister as he was speaking. And the second point, it, it, well, there's perhaps three points. The second point is Mr Graham is going on essentially making a speech. And if what he's trying to do is ask the question that he's now asked three or four times before, it's boringly repetitive. So I think uh, uh, Adam Searle had the, uh, had the floor on his line of questioning. I, I, I ask that you restrain Mr Graham from his speech making. Um, I'm happy to be restrained, Chair. Well, consider yourself officially restrained, Mr Graham. Um, and and I'd, I'd urge, I'd urge um, both witnesses and the committee to try and just do this in a in a measured manner and not talk over each other. And and I think I think part of the problem is that both sides of this have have have, um, have been interjecting. Is there a final question from the opposition? Uh, well, th there was, Mr. Chair, and it was this uh, to to the minister. The minister, minister, we don't say the public health orders are draconian. We we accept them as necessary. I'm just wanting to. Uh, are you sure you've got a firm grasp on what's actually in the public health orders? Because your answers today seem to be revealing a, that you don't understand what's actually in the 14 May public health orders. I just read the 14 May public health order to you. Well, with respect, so I'm, I'm, more, I'm more than comfortable about what my obligations are. All right. Um, that concludes that round of the opposition questions. Um, uh, Commissioner, could I just ask for a fairly straightforward response from you? Are New South Wales police now still asking people what their reason is for being out in 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 public space? Are New South Wales police doing that now? It would be if you were a country New South Wales and your driver's license said you lived at Bondi. Yes. Well, apart from that, oh, apart I from think enforcing that, no, just, well, a apart. <laughs> Well, Commissioner, apart what from the enforcement the... You didn't like it, so now what, you're going to reframe it? Um, well, Commissioner, if you, if you just have some patience. Um, apart from enforcing the prohibition on regional travel, are police across New South Wales asking people now whether or not they have a reasonable excuse um, for being away from their home? No. Um, and and now that you've now that you've taken on board the line of questioning, can you can you give an unambiguous statement to the people of New South Wales that it's your understanding that people no longer require a reasonable excuse under the public health orders? Can you just make that an unambiguous statement to that effect? Are you in a position to do that? Because it's not as simple as that. If you have had coronavirus just say, then you have to isolate at home for 14 days. Do you accept that? Well, Commissioner, I do, but that's got nothing to do with reasonable excuse. So can we go back to my question rather well, than divert it off? You're the trying to right pull now. apart something here, and I just don't agree with the line of questioning. So I've answered your questions. I'm just not sure what you want from me. Well, Commissioner, have you given a very clear direction to the thousands of police across the state who are having the difficult job of enforcing the public health orders, that as of the 15th of May, people no longer need a reasonable excuse to be leaving their home. Have you given that direction to help police on the ground? Yes, it's gone out as a fact sheet in relation to that, to all police. When did that fact sheet go out? I'll take that on notice. How is it then that Highway Patrol um, issued a $1,000 fine to a 19-year-old at Emu Plains on Friday night for failing, uh, for failing to have a reasonable excuse. And how is it that you didn't flag that and have it reversed? How did that happen? Despite the people 
in the Sydney metro area, 17,000 police, 1,200 tickets. If this was supposed to be a perfect situation, then you wouldn't have a judicial system, Mr. Shubridge. So that young man can write to me, I'm happy to review it again, or he can elect to take the matter to court. But Commissioner, you said earlier that you only had a, a, a small number of infringements to review. So in that small number, there was one with such a glaring error in it. Is it because if, you didn't if, understand if, the law if, review? If, the one, if that's Is the one that's got the biggest the problem, law? if that's the biggest problem in my life, then I'm happy to accept that criticism. If it was a perfect world, then we wouldn't need magistrates and judges, Mr. Shubridge. I would determine everything. So that is obviously not the case because none of us are above making mistakes. So please feel free to write to me in relation to that matter and I'll review it. Well, Commissioner, I, mean, that's the biggest, I think that's Mr. The Graham, biggest Mr. Graham and myself have... During this pandemic, Mr. Mr. Shubridge, I'll wear it as a badge of honour. Um, Ms. Commissioner, Mr. Graham and myself at different times have been trying to understand what, what your current comprehension of the public health orders made on the 14th, effective on the 15th of May is. Um, and, and it seems to me you still seem to believe that there's some kind of obligation to have a reasonable excuse. And to be honest, I find it difficult to understand well, you've how already you already agreed with me that there is. You've already agreed with me that there is. you do need a reasonable excuse. No, no to be... To be quite clear, Commissioner, I, I, the you law is me, If you're in country the New South is, Wales, then you do need to have a reasonable excuse. You've already agreed with me. Um, no, Commissioner, there is no obligation about reasonable excuse. And I think it's unfortunate you keep making this mistake. Do you understand that there's a blanket prohibition on travelling to regional New South Wales? Um, and that You've the already agreed with me. I'll have, have to go back excuse, to the transcript. The obligation of reasonable agree, excuse has been Do you understand that? New South Wales. All right. Uh, Commissioner, are you going to go and review the public health orders in light of the questioning and the answers today to ensure that you're up to speed with them? No. You're not? All right. Um, Commissioner, um, how many fines have now been issued to people who are aged under 18 for I'll breaches of the public health orders? Yeah, I'm happy to take that on notice and let you know. We'll definitely have that information. Um, well, Commissioner, did you review the $1,000 fine that was issued to the 14-year-old boy, um, I think, on the 12th of May? Did you review that $1,000 fine? I'll take that on notice. Um, well, Commissioner, um, how is it that a 14-year-old boy has been hit with a $1,000 fine by your police? Do you know? Do you know? Do you know the circumstances in which that happened? Because obviously he hasn't listened to the messaging. He hasn't listened to his parents. He hasn't listened to his school teachers. He hasn't listened to the premier. Hasn't listened to the police commissioner. Hasn't listened to the health minister. Hasn't listened to the chief medical officer. And he's putting people's lives at risk. I guess that's a short answer. And, and you know that from your three-line review, is that right? My understanding is that the tickets that have been given to particularly most young people, they've been given multiple warnings uh, and uh, some of the ones that we have looked at in detail had terrible criminal histories and obviously have no regard for public safety. So are you saying that... During any time, Commissioner, but certainly during a global pandemic. Commissioner, are you saying that if a... If a if a child has a criminal criminal history, that that that's one of the reasons why um, police choose to use their discretion and hit them with a thousand dollar fine under the public health orders. Is that part of the police? No, I'm just trying to balance the picture you're trying to paint about these poor fourteen year old kid. Well, Commissioner, how is a fourteen year old kid going to pay a thousand dollar fine? Do you know how that's going to work? How are police going to? How is that going to happen? It's not a matter for New South Wales Police. But surely it is a matter for New South Wales Police if they're issuing a thousand dollar fine to consider how no, another fourteen we, we year old do will not, do it. And whether factor, or not that's an effective measure. We're not a benefactor of any fines in the state of New South Wales. So what happens after that process is a matter for the judicial system and his parents and or guardians. Commissioner, do you accept that under the general law? fines can't be issued to minors and that there is 
an alternate mechanism through the through the juvenile justice system rather than the imposition of fines. Do you accept that's the, the standard rule apart from the public health orders? Um, we, we can still, under public health orders, give cautions, which we have done with juveniles. Uh, so we have applied many cautions and warnings uh, and official cautions and warnings to young people. So we have applied this ticket system in a very similar way that we would treat juveniles normally. No, Commissioner, do you understand that there's a that the police cannot issue fines against 14 year olds as a matter of general law and that it's well, fact highly unusual. Just allow me, Commissioner, if you just allow me to finish the question, it'd be simpler. But it's very unusual to allow fines to be issued against minors, such as we see under the public health orders, for the obvious reason that 14 year olds don't normally have $1,000 in loose cash. I think you accept that's the general problem. It's to detach this from a global pandemic, it's not helpful. Minister, will you seek to have amendments brought to Parliament to have the usual protections in place for minors so that they don't find themselves being hit with $1,000 fines going forward? Will you oh, seek to have the usual protections in place? We have no plans to, given that such a very, very, very small number of minors that have been hit, but everybody's got to be, um, got to be treated equal, so no. So you you're saying well, you can, and I'll be happy to consider it um, when it comes to cabinet, given the appropriate level of attention. Minister, do you accept that minors shouldn't be treated the same as adults in the criminal justice system, and that very different considerations apply to whether you hit a, a 14 or a 15 year old with a thousand dollar fine than a 21 or 31 year old? Do you accept that normally there are differences? Well, I think as you and I have discussed before, having been the minister responsible for juvenile justice in this state. Um, there are some kids out there that do need some serious correction. Is, is there any evidence that $1,000 fine to a 14 year old will be at all effective? I have to take that on In notice. terms of preventing? Oh, I have to take that on notice. I'll we'll tell you what, back back I was 14, Ron Mowen Lawns for a living. If you'd hit me with a financial penalty, I'd think twice about doing, uh, <laughs> doing something wrong. All right. But we'll get the full numbers of minors um, on notice. Is that right, Commissioner? He's already committed to that. All right, we'll go back to the opposition. No questions? We finished up? Okay. I think Mr. We're Chair, back who's to the question? Opposition Minister. Okay. All right. Um, oh, all right. Commissioner, I think Commissioner, I think I asked you that whether you'd um, personally reviewed the infringement issued to Mr. Harlan, and I think you said it was part of a batch that you had reviewed. Um, did you personally review the decision to not issue a fine to the Deputy Premier, Mr. Barillaro? No, but I was informed that that was the case, that there was insufficient evidence to pursue. Okay. Are you able to tell the committee what the distinguishing features were between the two scenarios? Between Mr. Uh, Harmon and Mr. I would, have, I would have to take it on notice uh, to give a you know a definitive legal answer to that in fairness. But my understanding was uh, that the deputy premier, uh, his family was uh, I think residing at the farm and they were doing work on the farm, which was totally acceptable, which is different to someone living between multiple premises. So. That's, I guess, the basic answer, but I would rather come back on notice with a, you know, a better legal uh, outcome, if that's okay. I, I, would, I would urge you to do that. And, and also, when you do give that complete answer on notice, um, just, just verify or otherwise uh, indicate. My understanding of the Deputy Premier's public comments was that he had gone to the uh, farm uh, to put up a cubby house with his small child. So I just, yeah, I look forward to that complete answer. That would be um, useful. I, I think, I, let's not verbal the Deputy Premier. Um, that was one of the reasons. That's one thing that he did at the farm. And that's like saying, oh, well, he went down to have lunch. Well, yeah, he well, had happy lunch for the, down there. Yes. But he also, he also um, was down there to take, um, uh, to, to undertake maintenance work. Uh, on um, on what was essentially what is essentially a working property, 
So um, try not to verbal anybody out of it because it might happen to you. Uh, well, that's why I, I urge the commissioner to give a, a full answer on uh, well, so No, I'm sorry. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a ridiculous response. Um, the reasons why um, Barra went to the farm were very quickly clarified after his press conference. He made it very clear that um, because there is, uh, because he cannot uh, use the property um, as, uh, as a revenue stream, he can't have maintenance, can't afford maintenance staff down there, or he didn't have his maintenance staff down there. So he went down and he um, mowed the lawns. I understand he fed the livestock, uh, and I suspect he also um, undertook uh, some some other maintenance work because it looks like it's quite a, a large property. But you saying that he's down there and the only reason he went and built a cubby house is, is is like saying the only reason he went down there was to, was to, was to eat a meal. Yes, he probably ate a meal, and yes, he built a cubby his a cubby house with his with his kid. Good luck to him. But at the end of the day, the reasons why he went down there, the main reasons why he went down there, were because he had to maintain he had to undertake maintenance on the property. And um, if you want to push the envelope on that, I'm pretty sure I can find very swiftly uh, some Labor MPs that have probably done the wrong thing. And I understand that your own Labor Senator, Deb O'Neill, by like putting on her Facebook on, the, on Holy Thursday that you, shouldn't, you should keep away from, uh, keep away from uh, the Central Coast, was in fact renting your own house out um, uh, through Airbnb. Um, I don't hear any adverse questioning about her. So let's not... Um, let's not uh, Put too much into uh, into the one reason why Barrett went down to his property. Can I say that he did uh, on, when I must provide a, a full written uh, response. Is my understanding uh, explaining what tasks he undertook? So uh, I would just put on the record that he complied fully with police. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to that answer on notice. And I was intended to ask this question of the Commissioner, although the Minister seems to know a lot about this, so I'd, uh, if he knows the answer, he's welcome to respond. But Commissioner, when you come back, can you just indicate factually which, to which property we're referring? Multiple media reports have talked about Dungowan Estate, but that wasn't the suggestion from the Deputy Premier uh, publicly. He suggested the property was in Nerega. So, in when you respond, could you just make it clear to which property are we referring? So, can you tell me which one you're referring to? Well, I'm, my understanding is the Deputy Premier's comments were about retiring to a property in Nerega. Um, uh, multiple media reports have then referred to the a property, the Dungowan Estate, which is nearby but not in Nerega. I could almost certainly say it's the same one, but I will take it on notice. Appreciate it. Um, Minister, will you guarantee that the 17,000 plus police in the police force who uh, have been doing uh, their duty in this difficult time uh, won't be prohibited from uh, receiving a, a, a pay increase under the government's wages policy after the 30th of June this year? Can you give that guarantee? Yeah, full well that the wages policy is determined by the Treasurer. So um, why don't you def ask the Treasurer that question? Well, Obviously, you're the Minister responsible this, 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 for the police this, force in this, this state. Is not, I'm just really. asking you what the government's policy is. Um, what is the government's policy in regard to the police force of New South Wales? Will they be prohibited from seeking or receiving their pay rise post the June chair. this year? I'm pretty sure that's not in the terms of reference for this committee. Excuse me, point of order, Chair. Yep, yeah, sorry, Ms. Ward, point of order. <clears throat> Thank you. Unless I'm mistaken, I believe this inquiry is into the government's management of the COVID-19 pandemic, not into the government's wages policy, <clears throat> well, which is um, not within the purview of this inquiry. I ask the um, question be directed to the terms of reference of this inquiry. Well, Mr. Mr. Chair, just to the point of order, the, um, everybody on this committee well knows uh, that the Premier and the Treasurer have floated the idea of the government saving money through a so-called wage freeze, inverted commas, and to redirect that money Everybody that would otherwise go in pay rises into, into COVID-related matters in terms of the recovery of the state budget. So it is oh, within right. the terms uh, of I, I, I get your... Ms. Ward, I'll hear from you briefly and then I'll go back. To the point yes, of order. 
we have experts here who've been drawn away from their frontline services to uh, attend this committee hearing today to ask questions about the terms of reference for which this committee is constituted. And it's very clear that this question is out of order and I ask you to rule it so. All right. Well, look, I do understand the nature of your point of order, but I, I think Mr. Sill makes the point quite fairly that the, the impact of pay rises in light of the pandemic is a matter of, of general discussion. And I think it does relate to the terms of reference. And I'll go back to Mr. Sill. Um, um, Minister? Yes, Minister. Well, uh, well, sorry, well, is, that a further, is that a further point of order, Ms. Water? Are you just, you should, it, just taking issue with the ruling? Uh, a bit of both, actually. Um, well, but I, I, won't, I won't allow, I won't allow you to take issue with the ruling. Issue. We've had these questions in other sessions, Chair, and I think, you know, for the sake of just sensibility, um, it's clear that this can't be answered. It's an IPART determination uh, well, and, well, and, a, well, and a future matter, which is to be determined. Well, well, so, well, 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 um, well how, how it will be answered, how it will be answered is not relevant to whether it's in order. The question is in order, and um, we'll go back to Mr. Sill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Minister, can you give a guarantee, well, can you tell us what your government's policy is in relation to the pay of the police officers of this state will they be prevented from seeking receiving a pay rise well, post -lead during this year excellent question because the treasurer you may not have noticed has already said that it hasn't been determined yet but if you're asking me if you're asking me do i advocate um for better um uh, more money better conditions proper recognition uh improved welfare opportunities for police the answer is a hearty yes uh, I have always uh, advocated for all the combat agencies that have been um, under my uh, jurisdiction as a minister for five and a half years. Uh, if you're asking me, do I think that um, uh, politicians should stop criticising the New South Wales Police Force? I say yes. If you're asking me if, if parliamentary committees should not uh, use every opportunity to criticise, uh, I mean, once, just once, I'd like somebody from the opposition or the Greens to actually thank the police for the work that they're doing instead of just sitting, pa passing judgment um, on things that they've got either no idea about or have never even had to undertake themselves. I mean, I find it really offensive that in an hour and a half sitting in this committee, you have not once acknowledged the fact uh, that uh, the police have been the frontline agency on, on, the, on the COVID-19 response, on the back of being uh, heavily involved in the bushfire operations. You haven't once thanked the police commissioner uh, for his stewardship of the New South Wales Police Force. You yeah, haven't once asked me after the welfare of any of those officers that have actually been uh, exposed. And in fact, there's been a few that have been uh, victims of COVID-19. Uh, instead, you just want to sit there and, and pull apart their um, uh, their response. Well, I mean, I, I find that offensive. And I also find it quite offensive that you think that I wouldn't, as the Minister for Police, always advocate for the best interests of the rank and file members of the police force. Well, of course I would. You'd, if, if you'd ever listened or read a press release that I've put out, that's that's the bottom line. I mean, yesterday I spoke to police, two police officers uh, who uh, who had been injured in the line of duty, uh, and uh, and you know, and all of them will say to me that uh, uh, you know they, uh, they they don't do this for the money; they do this because they want to serve the community. But having said that, always in everything that I engage in, will be I will be uh, advocating for improved working conditions for the police. But I also would ask you, as a member of parliament to help me in that regard by trying to encourage the police and remind everybody uh, in your, um, uh, in your, under, under your influence and jurisdiction that they're doing a good job. Well, uh, Minister, I've never made any criticisms of the police. Uh, well, in your this situation question is hardly So, just, well. so just, 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 be, just don't interrupt, please. My questions weren't about your personal attitudes or actions. My questions to you as a minister in this government is what is the government's policy about police wages Post okay, well, you're clearly, you're clearly so can you answer the question as a minister of this government? You're not some free agent, Minister Elliott. You're a minister of this I'll government. What is the government's clearly policy? Haven't, Adam, you clearly haven't been um, keeping abreast of current affairs because the Treasurer has repeatedly said the matter is yet to be determined. I'm assuming that you're going to be, you're going to be knocking back the 2.5% that uh, the politicians are getting. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. What about your What about your legal fees that you issue as a practicing barrister? You're going to be uh, Are you going to be uh, keeping them static as well? Minister, oh, Minister I, I might just stop you, know you there. 
Uh, um, Mr. Chan, actually, I just wanted to come back to the question around um, the role of social distancing on public transport. I note your earlier answers saying that um, these aren't, these won't be required to um, be giving in, in, um, infringement orders. Um, I wanted to ask specifically if the New South Wales Police Transport Command will have any role in terms of providing advice or guidance to um, to commuters. Um, so I've spoken to the Secretary of Transport about this, and obviously it will be a challenge for transport as more and more people get on or back to the transport system. Um, and, and I have asked that police uh, not play any role in the enforcement of good health advice. Um, we would certainly be on the system, uh, you know, traveling on the trains and the buses to ensure that, uh, you know, that people aren't self-policing good health advice at the same time. Uh, so from my perspective is that I see an important role of police being visible, um, but you know, it's not the primary role of police on the transport system to be giving advice and guidance on on good hygiene or, or you know, social distancing. Okay, you said it's not the primary role, so they won't have a role in the enforcement on of of but, the public health know, orders. But again, is it just to be clear that that you know, unless there's a new health order coming for transport, is that the number of people that will be on a bus or a train will be determined by health and transport. I'm not aware that there is an order that attaches that to a thousand dollar ticket. Like I, I just think that transport are trying to provide good health advice to commuters and they will, by the best of their ability, limit the amount of people on platforms and buses and trains to what is safest, but my understanding is there isn't uh, an enforcement penalty notice that goes with that. If that makes sense. Yep, that makes sense. Thanks, Commissioner. I wanted to come then to the back to the issue of work sites. You said that. Um, well, I, I don't want to go with you. What, what you wanted to recap on your answer around what the role of police will be on work sites in terms of um, enforcing social distancing. And again. Um, Police don't enforce social distancing because it's only the advice. Um, and the reason that we all practice it and we're practicing it today as a committee and a witness is because it's a sensible thing to do. We could all be in the same room sitting at the same table, not breaking any laws. Okay, so what would your advice then be? Would it be then that, that the appropriate place for someone wanting to make a complaint would be, as it usually is to make a work health and safety complaint, would be then to make it to safe work? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but I think also management plays such a key role in this. And, and again, I've used Bunnings as an example um, that have been an example. Of, you know, really Bunnings and those similar sorts of, of industry were on the cusp of being closed because of big numbers that they managed so well uh, to put in place, you know, new roles of people managing numbers of people in the store and lining up, et cetera. So look, I think for mine, the management of construction sites need to play a continued role in making sure work safe or work sites are safe. Work cover could play a role in providing advice and guidance, but I think management will continue to need to lead in relation to this to make sure things like smokers and safety briefings are done in a way where you're not bringing 30, 40 people together in a very small or defined space. Um, but from my perspective, you know, I'm not asking for police to respond those type of complaints because I think it's unhelpful. Thanks, Commissioner. Well, we're back to, we're still with the opposition, Mr. Searle, Mr. Graham. You're, you're on mute, Mr. Searle. You're not, can you hear me? Can now. Okay, good. Uh, Commissioner, you indicated the Premier asked you to conduct an initial 
investigation in relation to the Ruby Princess um, in your role as State Emergency Operations Controller. Um, what powers in that role did you have to conduct that investigation? As a CECON, um, you know, you have certainly strong powers, but in that role, uh, I reviewed information. Uh, I didn't have to enact any powers. So at the end of the day, it was just about obtaining the information, which I did without order. Uh, that was just a request uh, to health and a request uh, through the Ports Authority. Uh, so I didn't have to enact or use any powers under the State Emergency uh, and Rescue Management Act. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Yeah, it does. And you hold that position because you are the Police Commissioner of New South Wales, isn't it? No, it's actually a legislative position uh, that is normally held by a Deputy Commissioner of Police and there is a Deputy CECON, excuse the acronym, that's an Assistant Commissioner. Um, but for a period of, of, of about four weeks, an instrument was, uh, a legal instrument was confirmed and the Governor signed off on the New South Wales Police Commissioner, Mick Fuller being the CECON. Um, but that has now been retracted and Deputy Commissioner Gary Warboys is back into that position. On notice, I could give you the exact dates if required. Okay. 18.2a of the State Emergency and Rescue Management Act says it's you, other, unless there's another instrument made, but i um, happy for you to provide those dates. Uh, Commissioner, oh, you said the Premier asked you to in undertake the investigation. She has said on a number of public occasions that she directed you to. How did she convey her desire for you to do it? Was it in writing or was it verbally? No, it was, it was verbally. And when I say the Premier asked me, I mean, the Premier, uh, when, when you, you're the Commissioner of Police and, and the Premier ask you to do something that's lawful, I mean, clearly you could take it as a direction it wasn't, do you think this is a good idea? She asked me to do it. Uh, and I'm sure if I had said no, then maybe she would have gone to a special commission of inquiry straight away. Mm. Saved a bit uh, of time. Mr. So, we were going to Mr. Borzak's time now. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, before I get started, uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, look, I'd like to put on the record that uh, uh, I really personally appreciate the hard work you and all the uh, uh, hard-working men and women in New South Wales Police have been doing for us. Uh, I don't want to get savaged by the uh, the Minister for not uh, uh, saying that. Um, you never know what he's liable to say to me, but uh, thank you very much for what you're doing and what you continue to do. It, it is a hard task and we are very much feeling our way through this whole process in the dark. I understand that. And also, of course, uh, if we weren't doing what we're doing, then I, I suspect, no, in fact, I know our numbers of infections and deaths would be much, much higher than what they are. Um, about 1,200 infringements uh, have been issued for breaches of social and uh, social exclusion rules to date. Can you give the committee a breakdown of numbers? And I don't recall whether you've already undertaken to take this on notice or not. The reasons for the fines and the financial penalties imposed? Uh Sorry, sir. Who's that to you, Robert? Sorry, that's to the, the Commissioner. Oh, I think that in part I've taken questions I noticed about juveniles, but I'll take a holistic question from you, Mr Borzak, to answer that on notice, if that's OK. No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, uh, further to that, have any people elected to have penalties reviewed by NCAT or, or taken them to court? Um, not at this stage, but could I take that on notice as well? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, you, st you stated early in the piece, and I don't recall the exact date, uh, that you would be personally reviewing, and that's, that's been subject to a lot of discussion here today, every case where a fine was imposed. Um, why did you think that was necessary? I think the, the powers themselves, we, we probably won't see again in our time. I, I, and I think that the powers are extremely strong powers. Um, I think they would have been confronting to some people. Uh, and from my 
You know, I'm still on the record, Mr. Borzak, saying I'll, I'll be the happiest person when they're turned off. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think we all are, will be, of course, because it'll indicate a much better space for our community. That's for sure. Um, could could we have handled uh, the enforcement with uh, this pandemic any better, uh, in your view? Could it have been done any better in any way? I, I think I answered this earlier, but I feel as though that the speed of the pandemic, what was happening globally, uh, the expectation on our emergency services, government departments, when you think in the, in the space of a week or two, half of the public sector employees were working from home. Uh, you know, there's a lot of fear in the community. There was lots of deaths at this stage, particularly in Italy. Um, I feel as though that the evolution of the health orders, the education of the police in relation to that, um, I think there's always degrees of improvement, but I really think that we did the best we could in a difficult situation. I think the challenge will be not whether I'm judged on one ticket or not, Mr Borzak. I think it'll be how the community and the New South Wales Police Force relationship is once the emergency is over. Yeah, well, yeah, well, that's it. That's interesting because my next question was going to be um, what was and what is your feedback from frontline police regarding the reception they're getting from the public? Um, certainly very early in the piece when you know, people were being asked uh, around the isolation laws when they were in parks or when they were on the beach uh, and they felt that their you know, civil liberties were being impeached. Um, you know, police were, were confronted with, you know, not tens of thousands, but certainly thousands of, of unhappy people. And I think the application of discretion is apparent. And I think that is so important to me in that we applied these laws in, in a very measured way. But the other hand to that, Mr. Borzak, I don't think I've been stopped in the street or we've had more letters or feedback around the minister's comments about how well the police have actually handled this event. So, whilst it may be vexed in terms of people's passion for or against the health orders, I've never been stopped and received more positive feedback about the leadership of the police force. And 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 just to get back to the nub of, the, of that question, what's the feedback you're getting from police themselves or you don't, you don't have a feel for that? Yeah, I do. Um, can I tell you that our, our sick leave has never been lower. Um, we've had police turning up uh, to work more than ever. I think police have never been prouder to wear the uniform. And I think much of that is because the community are so appreciative of where New South Wales is. Yeah. Um, just on a obviously related matter, how many police officers have actually contracted COVID-19 while on, on um, the job? So there were six officers and some admin staff, five of the officers contracted it from overseas travel, which I think sort of really does reinforce where we are at at the moment around overseas isolation. And the sixth officer got that through community contact, uh, not through the work environment. But I will take on notice and just get that updated for you. But at my understanding coming in this morning, there hasn't been any transmission uh, through the workplace. And uh, can I say, if you look at the New York Police Department, I think at one stage they were up to 3,000 officers who had contracted uh, the virus. And I think, sadly, I think they'd lost 80 lives. This is just in the New York Police Department. I think that was about six weeks ago, Mr. Borzak. So, again, you know, proud of the police force, proud of all the police employees. And I think the way we've handled it um, compared to other countries is outstanding. Yeah, well, that was going to be my next line of my next question. Actually, how many have have contracted it in the line of duty? Um, and you're saying none. Um, and also, of course, what 
what would have been their workers' compensation uh, position, I suppose they would have been covered under workers' comp if they had contracted it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, would you characterise the processes that you've had to implement uh, have been working well on a day-to-day -day basis? I think any time the laws changed, and we saw that with the Bail Act, we went through a period maybe four or five years ago where the Bail Act, I felt like it was changing every other week. And it is complex for police to apply laws when they're changing quickly because you've got to retrain an entire organisation. And it's one of the reasons why we put in some additional safety measures for the community who had received uh, infringement. So, um, you know, there are lessons learned in relation to comms, but any time you have an evolution of powers that police have to enforce uh, and, and that's moving quickly, that will always create challenges, uh, unfortunately, Mr Borzak. Could you just quickly on notice maybe take for me, um, uh, could I get uh, from you uh, or your office uh, the precise reasons why Mr Barillaro was not fined? I think I have already taken that on notice as a previous okay. question. But I'll, I, will, I, I acknowledge your question on notice. Thank you. I'm, I'm finished. All right. Thanks, Mr Borzak. Um, while we're on this thread, Commissioner, can you provide the reasons why Mr Harwin was fined? Yes. Yep. And and is that being challenged at the moment? Do you know? Um, I, I would say I'll take that on notice. Understanding that we may have received correspondence, um, but I don't think that was uh, an official you know, process that would happen naturally. So could I take that on notice? Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. And look, I think everybody um, everybody agrees that with the rapid iteration of different public health orders, it is tricky to keep, get your head around it. And no doubt it's difficult for police to keep up to date. I think that's a common point. Um, Mr. Kutz Trotter, um, in terms of the, um, yes, you're still there, I see. Um, in terms of the um, um, social distancing guidelines, um, I know the police are just part of a, a very broad portfolio that you're responsible for as secretary. Are there social distancing rules in place across the um, um, across your department? Uh, yes, there are. We uh, reflect public health advice wherever we can, but of course there are some situations in which, in delivering uh, our essential public services, we're not able to maintain 1.5 metre distance, for example. Yeah. Um, do those guidelines also cover the New South Wales Police? Um, and have they been provided to the New South Wales Police? No, the New South Wales Police is a separate entity. So they relate to the Department of Communities and Justice. All right. Um, Commissioner, well then going back to you, um, what are the social distancing guidelines that are in place for police to have practice in the course of their, their work as police? Thanks. I'll, I'll, answer, I'll take the answer on notice in terms of providing you the fact sheets that we're sending out, but as an essential service, um, you know, police have to come in contact with people. They need to sit next to each other in cars, et cetera. Um, so the reality is it's much like um, if you think about why Initially, people who live together in a home didn't have the same restrictions. It's much like in a command, they are working so close together at some point in time, you know, other than doing your best to maintain social distancing, it's probably not as effective as it is for people who can work from home and uh, undertake other duties. But we have signage up, we've put an enormous amount of information out and I think the fact that there have been no transmissions in the workplace um, speaks volumes to the outcome of that. Well, I, I think we're all grateful for the fact that there doesn't appear to have been any workplace transmission. But, and we all, I think, accept that there'll be occasions where police, by reason of having to exercise their powers, will not be able to comply with the 1.5 metre restriction. But is there, a, is there a standing provision that says 
uh, wherever possible. Police should comply with social distancing in order to protect their health and safety and those they interact with. That messaging is up in police stations. It's on computer screens. We're um, providing additional information to police stations, particularly to help the community. So that information is certainly out there. What about but when again, police are interacting? Sorry, Commissioner, did you finish? No, again, what, I just... What about when police... Yeah. Yeah. You've got this delay. You go. I'll, I'll be... Now, again, I just would say that social distancing is good health advice. There, there, there's no crime, there's no penalty attached to those who don't engage in it. No, yeah, I, I'm not asking about a penalty, Commissioner. Um, I'm asking whether or not there's a standing direction to police that they should practice social distancing in all their interactions with the public, uh, unless the circumstances mean that, that that's not practical. Is there a standing direction to that effect to protect both the police and standing, members of the public? There, there is an enormous amount of information that reinforces the importance of social distancing and hygiene. Well, Commissioner, my officer has my office has had repeated concerns raised with us, often supported by photographic um, evidence of police regularly not practicing social distancing as they go about their duties and when they engage with members of the public. Uh, are you aware of those con of concerns like that being raised with your office? Um, look, I can't tell you how many photos I've received about people not uh applying good hygiene and social distancing i hope i never get another photo in my life all i can do is provide the highest level of work health and safety advice for police uh, and in the circon i hope i did that to the community as well and i would say again the fact there's been a zero transmission rate sick leave is down crimes down you know i can't thank the members of the police force enough so, Commissioner, can you provide us on notice with the direction that has been given to police to engage, um, to, to practice social distancing in all their in all their interactions? I'll take on notice the work health and safety information that we have provided. Um, what about the issue of personal protective equipment? Um, um, what what if any consideration was given to providing police with personal protective equipment, and most particularly masks? Um, we in order to protect we, them and the public. We purchased yes, go, additional go. masks and gloves and hygiene um, products. We took the best health advice in relation to when officers needed additional PPE. And, and what, in what circumstances is there a direction that police should use PPE when they're engaging with members of the public? So I'm happy to provide on notice the advice we got from health in relation to that. Have you operationalised that advice? Yes, we have. I mean, at the end of the day, work health and safety officers still have the ability to make their own assessment around their own safety. Um, the issue around masks has been cleared by New South Wales Chief Medical Officer that they are ineffective um, in relation to stopping the spread of the virus. Now, we know in certain circumstances, officers still opted to wear masks, and that was fine as well. So is it, so you, your position is you've got advice from the Chief Medical Officer that masks would be ineffective in protecting police and the public? As a general, uh, as a general piece of PPE, that's correct. Now, when officers were at that time doing home isolation checks on those who had returned from overseas who had the virus, um, obviously in those situations, officers were wearing masks. We saw in uh, the international airport operations, some officers were wearing masks, but again, the information from chief medical officers, and this has been across Australia, that masks are generally ineffective from stopping the virus spreading unless you actually have the virus. In the event, and I hope we don't get a second wave, but in the event 
there is a second wave. Is there a sufficient stockpile of personal protective equipment available to police to ensure that each police officer can have access to personal protective equipment if that becomes necessary and is the advice of the Chief Medical Officer? Yes. That, that's a yes, sorry, Commissioner, I, I couldn't hear. Yes. That's a yes. And does that include masks and gloves? And hygiene products. All right, including hand sanitizer and the like. Yes. And and sufficient for the entire force if that's needed. Is that your position, Commissioner? Yes, it is. We've done modelling in relation to the numbers of police that will need it, uh, and and uh, the stocks that we have on at hand. PPE for a period was difficult to get, um, but that is certainly uh, as people are producing locally. And, and uh, I guess overseas contracts are opening up is that it's not as difficult to get as it was, say, in early March. All right. Um, well, I, I know you'll be um, disappointed, but unfortunately, the, the time for questions has now um, concluded. But I think Mr. Searle just wanted to put something briefly on the record before you depart. Mr. Searle. A, a comment directed to myself that was disparaging and uh, mentioned barristers fees. To avoid any public misconception, I have not practiced law on a commercial basis for some period of time, although I do maintain a current practicing certificate. All right. Thank you, Mr. Searle. Um, last time I checked, I, I still had a practicing certificate as well. Um, could I? Could we, um, as a committee, could I thank uh, Mr. Coots, um, the Minister and the Commissioner for their time and their assistance today? And I know a number of questions have been taken on notice. The committee has resolved to have those answers provided within 21 days. Um, that concludes this session of the hearing of the Public Accountability Committee. We will be returning at 2 p.m. Uh, with Minister Anderson, followed by Minister Chair um, at 3 p.m. Uh, so thank you very much for your attendance today, everybody.